I think Victor was going to call up the music team again. Um, <laughs> would have been good too, right? Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I heard a story this week that I found interesting. Every week uh, there was a, a couple who went to church uh, together, and, and every week the husband would fall asleep in the middle of the sermon. His wife decided to take a bag full of garlic along because he hated garlic. And so every time he would fall asleep, then she would just uh, wave it in front of his nose, and hopefully he would wake up. And so, uh, sure enough, middle of the sermon, the husband starts falling asleep and uh, actually drifts off into a fairly deep sleep. She puts the garlic under his nose, and he grunts a little bit, and, uh, but keeps on right, right on sleeping. She took her chance and held it under his nose again, and this time she was really getting, getting up there. And uh, he grunted. He shuffled a bit, and then he said, Honey, move your feet out of my face. I'm hoping that garlic won't be needed today, although judging from the first service, there were a few that were sleeping. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they were just really uh, concentrating on the words, right? Um, no, uh, it, it might be good for you to, uh, to stay awake today so that uh, something that happens to you that you're, you're going to say something that you're going to regret doesn't happen. So uh, God's word is active and exciting, and so I think today we'll be okay. Um, but if you do feel like you're, uh, you're about to drift off, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you should get more sleep on Saturday night then. But let's get right into it. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, uh, and we're going to start at verse 32. Albert got up to this point, uh, but then he said, you know what, this, this actually goes better with uh, chapter 5. And so that's one of those things that I do want to note for all of us this morning, is that sometimes our chapter and verse divisions, uh, they kind of get us to miss the point, or, or they, uh, they, they make us read something that isn't supposed to be a part of this. We're, we're supposed to actually read it later on. Uh, it, it helps to, uh, uh, it, it often is, is, is worse for, for organizing it. And so uh, this happens in Acts 4. Um, Acts, the end of Acts 4 goes much better with Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 contains a fairly depressing story that we are going to read part of. Uh, and it seems a little bit out of place with uh, Acts chapter 4, but really it is a continued thought. And I want to make sure that we understand that. What's happening in the church right now in Acts is there's, there's been huge growth. The disciples have gotten into a bit of trouble with the religious leaders that Albert looked at last time. Um, and, but, but the beginnings of the church are continuing to go forward, and the church is moving uh, in, in some pretty powerful ways. So let's read what kind of activity was happening in the church uh, at this exact uh, moment in Acts. Acts 4, verse 32, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Beautiful description of one of the fruits that came from, the early, from this early church. What, what, were they, uh, what were these people taking part in and why were they doing it? Well, the believers of this time were extremely generous. They didn't claim that any of their possessions were their own, it says. It's likely that they believed that actually they were just stewards of what God had already given them. This was actually God's uh, this was, this was God's money. It's not mine in the first place. And, uh, and, and, and so I, I think it was also, though, tied to Christ's teaching where he says, follow me, leave and follow me. Uh, all of this stuff, if it's going to get in the way of you following me, then you leave it. This stuff is actually meant to be a part of what uh, what I am calling you to do. They said, I'm, I'm, I'm loosening my grip on my possessions, at, at the very least. If someone is in need, I'll gladly give up something for them. And the result was generosity. Living life with an open hand, maybe we could say. 
I have it in my hand, but it's open. I don't have a tight grip. This is mine. Their generosity was gospel-inspired generosity. Christ loosened his grip on his very life, and he did that out of his generous love for the world. And that giving up, I believe, was inspiring to them. And really, it became a pattern for how these disciples would live. But it isn't just what Christ did in that, but it's also what we receive because of that generosity, right? Now, what was the key message here? Uh, With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He's alive. Uh, This is an important part of the life that they were proclaiming, that Christ was alive. And and that was actually a pattern for them. And and in the the letters, you, you, you hear Paul say at many points, you died with Christ, and now you raised to new life with him. And so uh, there's supposed to be new life. Our lives are supposed to look different than they used to. And we'll, we'll look at that a little bit more later on. Verse 33 continues with God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that they were generous. It was his grace that was at work in them. How generous is God's grace to us? We'll talk about that. If we go even further Eternal life really is the product of what Jesus has done and has showed us. That we are raising to new life. Christ, we we sang about it, death was arrested. Christ rose above even death. And so we also receive eternal life. That's generous. That's a huge generosity, isn't it? That we can look forward to life continuing even though our bodies die. Hebrews talks about every spiritual blessing is ours through Christ. Wow. What a, what a generosity that Christ has shown. What a generosity that he gives. And that generosity of Christ inspires his disciples. We also see that it was spirit-empowered generosity. The term one heart and one mind is one that comes up many times in the New Testament. We won't go through all of those, but it does come up over and over, and it's always the result of the Spirit working in individuals' lives. As the Spirit works in people, he brings people to common goals and purposes and work. And here, it looks like generosity. This was a description of how it looked, what the Spirit brought them all to do together. One question I have, um, was it possible for these believers of this time to muster up this type of generosity? Was it possible that they could just, out of their own, maybe I should ask you, Is is this type of generosity something that comes easy for us? Is this something that when you try, I'm going to live a generous life, how long does that last, right? But this was a spirit-empowered generosity. Psalm 133 gives us a picture, and it's it's an interesting picture. It's a weird picture to us. Um, But it says that unity is like oil poured on Aaron's head and running down his beard. That's really strange. Especially if you don't have a beard, you're wondering, why does Aaron have a beard? No, we're, we're getting uh, off track. It also says that it's like the dew from Mount Hermon coming down to Mount Zion. What's the, what's the point? What, what's the point that the psalmist is trying to make? It is that unity comes down on people. It comes down. It's not something that the people can muster up. Unity comes on us, and I think the Bible's clear on that. And I think that this type of generosity and the unity that it shows is the work of the Spirit in our lives. It is God's blessing on the people. So the question that we maybe ask ourselves is, 
if there's disunity in the church, what's the real problem? What's the problem if we're experiencing disunity? This week, Mel and I had a, had a rough day. And uh, I was angry at something. And I allowed that to make me ang- frus- sorry, frustrated with my wife. I wasn't actually angry at her. I was angry at something else. But I was frustrated with my wife. And there was a wall that very quickly built up between us. I didn't want to share anything with her. And she didn't want to share anything with me. In fact, we started to hold hands. And then we went, no. I'm not even going to share that. Useless. There was disunity. What was the real problem? What was the real problem? In Galatians, there are two lists. In Galatians, uh, at the, near the end of Galatians, I think it's in chapter 5, one of those lists gives us the fruit of the Spirit, and the other list shows us the works of the flesh. When we allow room for the Spirit to work in us, fruits of the Spirit come out. Love, joy, peace, patience, holding hands, all of those things, right? (laughs) When we don't live in the Spirit's guidance and we listen to our flesh, what's the list? That's an ugly list. It says this. Here are a few of the things. Sexual immorality. Hatred. Discord. Jealousy. Fits of rage. No, no, no. I'm not going to hold your hand. Selfish ambition. Factions. You know what factions are? Two groups of people fighting. They're factions. These are the results of not living in the Spirit's guidance. This type of unity and generosity are totally a working of the Spirit in their midst. Because we very quickly descend into that list, that other list, don't we? If we are not living life in the Spirit. And I think we'll see the flip side of this generosity as well in the story of Ananias and Sapphira. We'll see the flesh at work as well. Notice what, the, what that power brought about. One in heart and mind, generosity, testifying to the resurrection of Jesus. It says God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. This is not something they mustered up. It seems to say, and I, I, I think this says, that their actions say, I received so abundantly from God... So spirit work through the things that I've received to bless other people too. Give me opportunity to use what you've given me to give back to you and to others. That's the pattern of the early Christians. Now, in similar fashion to other times, Luke is one of those guys that often presents two competing um, people or groups. And then he says, now which one are you? And he describes this in Jesus' parables, and Jesus did this, did this too. So in Luke, it descri- he, he uses that uh, to uh, help us to ask that question. Which one are you? The wise and foolish builders. Which one are you? Do you build on the rock or do you build on the sand? Which one are you? Uh, good Samaritan. There's a bunch of people that pass by, but here's what the Good Samaritan does. Now, which one are you? And so he does that again. In similar fashion. And similar to the parables, he's giving us a kingdom principle. And that kingdom principle is generosity. How do you live your life? Which one are you? And so that's the question that I want to... It's going to sound like I'm closing this thing up. I'm not. I'm just beginning. Which one are you? That's the question that I want to leave you with. Which one are you? First example, short, doesn't need a lot of explanation because what you see is what you get. Joseph of Cyprus. Joseph is a believer, actually becomes an important character in Acts. His nickname is Barnabas, and you will read about him if you read through Acts. 
uh, son of encouragement. He had the spiritual gift of encouragement, and he used it well. He gives money from the sale of a field that he owned. He gives it to the disciples, and he says, here, use this to bless those in need. And that's the last we hear about it. Isn't that interesting? Period. End of sentence. Uh, it, there was nothing more at play other than gospel-inspired, spirit-empowered generosity. And I found that interesting. <laughs> Joseph gets this much, but Ananias and Sapphira get this much. I think, I, th I think Luke is trying to say something. I think. One of the problems, though, that uh, we have in every society, every community, there are two types of people, and, and from the outside, they look very similar. But what's going on inside is, is, is very different. Chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, describes another person, or a couple, uh, who, look on, who look good on the outside, but where their offering comes from is suspect at best. Let's read about what happened to Ananias. 5 verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself and brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the, uh, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not just lied to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. Yoma! Now we would question why Peter is so extremely against Ananias here, wouldn't we? Just on a surface reading? A gift is a gift, right? The dude gave some to the Apostles, what, what's the big deal? Just be thankful for what he gave, even if it was just a little bit. Shouldn't Peter be happy with any offering? But I think together with the previous story, if we understand that the generosity in the church was gospel-inspired and spirit-empowered, and we actually uh, read Peter's rebuke here, I think we start to see what the problem is was. And if we read his question to his wife, Peter's question to his wife, we, we get a little bit of a better idea what was going on under the surface here. Ananias must have lied in some way, right? He says he lied to the Holy Spirit, right? Um, that's, that's serious. That's serious. So if I lie to you, is it, I think Peter raises the stakes here. <laughs> He lied to the Holy Spirit. Like, this is, this, is, this is a deep issue. And then I look at that question that Peter asked Sapphira. Here, here it says in verse 8, uh, Sapphira doesn't know that Ananias has dropped dead. In verse 8, Peter asked her, Tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? She says, yes, that is the price. Um, so, it's likely that this was not the price, <laughs> right? Why would Ananias do that? Why would you and I do that? Why? Um, I've lied in my life. Yeah, I have. Why? Why do I lie? Um, the reason that I lie is because I want something. The reason I lie is because I want something for me, and I, and I, and I can't quite be honest because then I might have to give up something, right? <laughs> so we can probably put two and two together uh, that he likely, him and his wife, wanted the praise of man, right? Because we just hear about Joseph, good Joseph, I, I'm so thankful for your gift. They want to have that type of good, Ananias. Thank you for your gift. But he also wanted something else for himself. And that was, he, he wanted to keep a little bit. Oh, stuff a bit in my pocket too. 
double. He, he wanted double honor, right? Honor from his money and honor from men. Um, his heart wasn't in it. I think that's, that, that's a summary statement that we can make. He wasn't showing gospel-inspired generosity. He wasn't acting out of, out of the Spirit because the Spirit gave one my heart and one mind. And the fruit of the, of the Spirit is not praise from men but it's rather love and joy. And he did not show love and joy. Right? He did not show proper love and proper joy. Our giving must be in love and with joy. But look at the works of the flesh. Selfish ambition. Jealousy. I think those things could be at play in Ananias' life. So Peter comes down hard on Ananias because he's tried to manipulate in order to serve his own needs. And that is not a characteristic of the new community that was being set up. That was not a characteristic of Christ's church. There's an interesting passage, and I want to take you there, in 2 Corinthians. If you can turn there, we're going to read a good portion of that. 2 Corinthians 8. Paul has been uh, testifying about the Macedonian churches and their generosity. And this is uh, what he says, using similar language to Acts chapter 4. He says, And now, brothers and sisters, verse 1, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. This is what, this is, this is what the Spirit does. It, 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 it comes out when the Spirit comes on. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. That's an important phrase because Spirit-empowered generosity, gospel-inspired generosity, is completely voluntary. Completely voluntary. Completely on their own. And then they said they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord. Please, I want to give. Let me. That's a willingness that, that is astounding to me. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. That's an important, that's, that's, that, that's an important pattern. We give ourselves first to the Lord and then the Spirit comes on us and then we're empowered to give to others. Or we are led to give to others. That's really cool. That's, that's a, that verse right there, if, if you get anything from this, it is that. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. How do we know the will of God? It is about, it, it, it is giving to God, giving ourselves to God. It is holding what we have with an open hand and saying, Lord, take, take me. Romans chapter 12, right? Living sacrifice. Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm yours. You want to know how to test what God's will is? Give yourself to the Lord, you'll find out. Okay, let's go back. So we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. This is how grace comes out. I am not commanding you. Once again, it's voluntary. But I want to test the sincerity. I want to go a little bit deeper. Test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace, and now we get into the gospel, for we, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though the, he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. 
And here is my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. There's lots of people that have given. But you were, were the first to have the desire to do so. <laughs> and that's to be commended. Because your motive was right. Now finish the work. So that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. If the willingness is there, it's acceptable. Ananias' willingness was not there, and it wasn't acceptable. That, that's, that, that is basically what this is saying, and it's clear, clear to us. Peter says to Ananias, it was yours to begin with. Now, how did you use it? You could have given the same amount, and it would have been acceptable, right? He could have given the same amount, some of it, put it in the pocket, some of it. But it was his motive that was the problem. Instead, he listened to Satan and said, I want the glory, and I want money. Just before David is anointed king, this is where it gets a little bit terrifying for us. Just before David was anointed king of Israel, uh, the selection process weeds out all the others, right? And Samuel makes this statement that is a little bit terrifying for me. He says, uh, as, as David's father is confused, why David? He's small and unassuming. This is the statement that's made. Man sees the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. God sees the heart. <laughs> Yoma. God sees why you give what you give. This week, that knocked me one over the head. God sees my heart. That should humble me. The one that is 100% fair in his judgments, the one that I will stand before after my days are done here on earth, he sees my motives. The reason I think uh, we struggle so much with the story that happens to Ananias uh, and Sapphira is because he drops dead for having the wrong motives. The Bible doesn't say why, but it does say what the results of that were. And I would like to say this is the reason that we need to take this message to heart. Fear seized all who heard it. Ananias' wife was questioned. She confirmed it again. Their motive was selfish gain, and she dropped down dead. Once again, verse 11 says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Later on, it says that they, they were meeting in Solomon's colonnade, and people were scared to join them because <laughs> they were freaked out. What would this mean for us? I've had trouble understanding how a God of grace can strike people down like this. Haven't you? But then I thought, praise the Lord that he doesn't do it more often. I'm done. If this was the pattern, I'm done. Because you know what happens? Sometimes I come up here and I want you to like me. That's the reason I preach. That's a yoma. Once again. But then I realized something about grace and fear that are so important that we all get. There is something that happens with grace that is important to the transformation of our heart and our heart of stone, our heart that wants to go our own way and be transformed into a soft heart of flesh. And I have come to believe that at the crossroads 
of grace and fear is where Ananias and Sapphira die. And I think that it's the same crossroads that we all find ourselves at today. R.C. Sproul gave this definition of fear. Awe mixed with intimacy. Awe mixed with intimacy. Can I tell you where Ananias and Sapphira were after having found out their terrible motive? They were in the awe portion of fear, and it killed them. They didn't have intimacy, and so they were just scared to death. The fear of God is awe mixed with intimacy. It is understanding our place. That is awe. Sinful. But then it's also seeking to be close with the Lord. Intimacy. There's a great hymn. You all know it. Fairly sure. Amazing Grace. It says it this way. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. That is a wild statement. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. So grace can be described as the fear of God. Awe mixed with intimacy, right? Some would define grace as unmerited favor. I don't deserve it. And actually that is what, and I fully believe Ananias and Sapphira knew they didn't deserve anything once they found out their true motive. And then I go back to this idea of my own motive sometimes of even preaching. I'm messed up. I'm messed up. And I'm so thankful that, there, that grace is there, that God doesn't strike me dead. But he could. He could. Wouldn't that be a sermon illustration? Praise the Lord for that grace. But if I'm honest with my motives, and if you are honest with your motives... There are so many times we are totally messed up. But that is the start of grace. That's also the start of fear. Awe of him. And for the early Christians, this fear was real. For Ananias and Sapphira, this fear was real. So it was grace that taught my heart to fear, but grace my fears relieved because the gospel is one of grace for the sinner, for the messed up motives. The gospel says Christ not only wants to take care of that sin that you have that has me heading for death, but he wants a relationship with me too. He wants intimacy with me. He wants my spirit and his spirit to commune together and to transform even my motives. The deepest, darkest places, he wants to be a part of it. He knows better than I do that my motives keep me from experiencing that communion. Oh, for many of us, it isn't the outward things that keep us from God. It's what's happening in here. That keeps us from him. It isn't the things that we show others. It's not these things that are killing our relationship with Christ. It's the hidden things. It's the things that only we know. Which in and of itself is not totally right either, right? Because God sees it. He knows them too. It's the things that we just can't allow the Spirit to take and transform. No, that one's mine. Your gifts that you give to spread the gospel, when done out of willingness, become an offering acceptable to God. This is not the work of the flesh. This is a work of the Spirit. And dare I say that the only way that this will happen is if we have proper fear of the Lord, proper view of grace. It isn't cheap grace, save to do whatever I want. That's not fearing the Lord, that's manipulating him. Or at least trying to manipulate him. 
That's trying to be God over God, and that's not the calling of God on our lives. What is the calling that we have? Well, we have been called into the kingdom of light. Truth. Then let's walk in the light as he is in the light. And what do we have if we walk in the light as he is in the light? It says we have fellowship with one another. Unity. And we have fellowship with him. Intimacy. Your calling, my calling, is to live as children of the light. What that means is to open up our grip on our lives. Open up our grip on our, on our own lives and embrace the mission of transformation that God wants to do in us and through us. But it starts with being open to the Spirit working in us. It starts in the fear and the grace of God now, we can become very extremely depressed thinking about all of this. If even my motives, and, and I, I struggled with this all week, if even my motives are condemning me, then where am I at? But then I read 1 John 1, verse 9. Also in this live in the light section, it says this, if I confess my sin, if I get that out into the light, if I am honest with my depraved motives, he is faithful and he's just and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He forgives. There's forgiveness. And he cleanses us. He gives us the Holy Spirit to help us, to guide us, to transform us. That's the gospel. That's the gospel, and that's what inspired these believers in this time. Some of you might wonder why the name at the beginning or on your bulletin is uh, What's in Your Tent. Haven't really gotten to that yet. There's a story in Joshua chapter 7 that very much parallels this story, and it's a story of Achan. The Israelites have just stepped over the Jordan. They've gone into the promised land. They participated in uh, the, the first, not, well, actually probably not the first, but uh, a not battle battle where they marched around Jericho and done. And uh, they're, they're feeling pretty good about themselves. And so David, uh, or sorry, Joshua, uh, they, they go on, a, on another conquest. They go to attack AI. And that's not AI as in artificial intelligence or artificial insemination or... So I don't know why I look at you, Joe. Um, <laughs> AI, it's a place. And uh, the AIites, they push back this army. They, they think this is going to be an easy one. We're going to rout these people. They get routed. They get pushed back. And, you're... and Joshua starts to sound a little bit like the Israelites were in the wilderness. Why did you ever bring us here? We're just going to die over here. We should have just stayed over in the Jordan, over the other side of the Jordan, and you just brought us here to fail. God talks to Joshua and says, no, there's something hiding in your camp. That's a problem. One of your people took the stuff that was devoted to God and hid it in their tent after the battle of Jericho. Turns out, after a selection process, Achan of the tribe of Judah had hid silver and gold and other valuables in his tent for himself. Achan has a similar fate to Ananias. So let me ask you, what's in your tent? What's in your tent? What are the motives of your heart? Sometimes it's, it's hard to even tell what the motives of our heart are, right? Right? But maybe something today has come to your mind of something in your heart, something that you need to loosen your grip on.
And if you've seen sinful motives, then right now, the fear of God might be gripping you. But remember, when you experience that fear, the other side is intimacy. God wants to use the realization to bring you to be more dependent on him and his provision. He has provided forgiveness, and he has provided you the spirit to guide you. What grace. If this message brings you to a crossroads today, and I hope it does, that's good. That is the work of the Spirit in our lives. I want to read part of Psalm 51 this morning. And if you're at a crossroads today, and the Spirit has brought some stuff to mind, if it's convict, uh, the Spirit's convicted you of sinful attitudes or motives or behavior, I would encourage you to read Psalm 51 as your prayer this week. Read it over and over and over and over again. Every day, read this psalm. David has just found out that his motives, his behavior, what he was hiding in his tent, he's been convicted of. And he comes to this prayer, Psalm 51, starting at verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict. And justified when I judge. You think there's fear there? He's showing that proper fear. I'm dead meat. Verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Open my lips, verse 15. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I, would, or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is deeper. My sacrifice is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Isn't that clear? Isn't that clear? And that's just what the gospel of grace does for us. It cleanses us. It inspires us. It becomes the pattern for us. And through the Spirit's work, it leads us to live fruitful lives of sacrifice and blessing others. This is what it did in the early church, and it is through this type of honesty and integrity that the Spirit desires to work in and through us as a church to be a blessing to the nations. But where does it start? Where does it start? It starts right here. Acts 4, verse 32 to 37. Are we, are we scared of that? This is what happens this is what happens when we are honest about our fallenness and his grace. Actually, the book of Acts, in, in its it, it, total, this is what happens when people are honest about their fallenness and his grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give ourselves to you. Pray that you would strengthen our feeble hands that want to hold on to stuff. Pray that our very lives we would give over to you and may we be a blessing to those around us as we connect 
with your spirit and as we open up ourselves to your spirit's work within us. In Jesus' name, amen.